Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dummer together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service and jbiztechvalley.com. Well, you know, Rabbi Simon, we have a special guest with us today who is a 40-year, has a 40-year tenure in state government and no one has ever tried to uh, remove him from his position. And this is amazing. His name's Bob Freeman. So welcome to the show, Thank Bob. Thank you. At he least is, not knowingly. Knowingly, right. Yes. right. The, you weren't the governor over he's here. He's the executive director of the Committee on Open Government, COOG. COOG. <laughs> and I got to tell you, you know, you and I have known each other for many years as Long a reporter. Time. And, you know, you, ha you keep, you, you sort of keep the records uh, or the, uh, everyone on their toes as to open meetings law and freedom of information requests mm -hmm. and, you know, all of that. So, I mean, that's really a very valuable uh, But that's service. a state job, though? It's a that's state job. Down. The Committee on Open Government it's, is a tiny unit within the Department of State. I say tiny. The staff is two of us at full strength. Right. And uh, I have had, for 40 years, forever, in essence, what I consider to be the best job in state government. Yeah. All we do all day, every day, is offer advice and opinions, either verbally or in writing, to anybody who has a question about what's public and what's not. Uh, primarily in relation to two laws, our freedom of information law, lots of people know it as FOIL, and the open meetings law. And when I suggest that we give advice to anybody, I mean exactly that. We take loads of inquiries from people from state government, local government, members of the public, members of the news media. It doesn't matter. Our only goal <coughs> is to give what we believe to be the right answer under the law, regardless of the source of the question. So we're not there to support the government. We're there to do the right thing. And, and I'm not suggesting that the two are mutually exclusive. <laughs> but um, it's a very interesting job for obvious reasons. Government touches everything. But when this was created, what, 1974? 74. Then mm -hmm. you were the first person to be the executive director. No, that's or you not, were on that's staff. That's not true. I was on staff. staff. And then two years later, you moved into being executive director. Correct. OK. Correct. So it's 40 years with the Committee on Open Government, mm -hmm. but 38 years as the executive director. A distinction almost without a difference. That's right. yes. <laughs> yes. So uh, who was, was there someone who was executive director prior to you? Or yes. Who was that? His name is Lou Thompson. I don't know if you remember the name. Oh my he, gosh, he, yeah. He passed away a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, he was the first director and... Was um, he part of the Pataki administration? He was part of Pataki. He was part of the Rockefeller administration. Right, right, Which is right. how he got that job. And when the committee was created, when FOIL was first enacted, uh, it was signed into law by Governor Malcolm Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't know that name, but... Um, <laughs> it's the one year he was governor. Well, that's right. Yeah. And, and FOIL may be among his best legacies. Wow. So are you... Uh, and right now, I mean, we mentioned Lou Thompson was with the Rockefeller and the Pataki administrations. So he's obviously a Republican, mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't matter whether, you know, it's not like the Board of Elections where you should have one Republican, one Democrat as the two people uh, in the office there. I've been exceedingly yeah. fortunate. Um, that is clear. I've served under Democrats and Republicans, and it doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, sometimes people will call and they say, you know, I'm the Democratic chair or the Republican chair from XYZ County. Uh, you know, my, my stock response is, I don't care. I don't want to know what's your question. Right, exactly. What's your question? <laughs> that's that's all I want to do. Is so answer the question. On your on you, you have a very you have an extensive website mm -hmm. and it's really informative. I mean, you give people samples of letters that they should write. But you write. don't know how how informative it really is. Tell me. Um, first of all, the website is easy to find. We're the only committee in open government in the world. If you just Google C O O G, you'll get there. You'll get there. And as you suggest, um, you have on the website the text of the laws, frequently asked questions. We have a news column which describes developments both in legislation as well as judicial decisions. And you write that? Um, well, either, either I write it or our assistant director, Camille Jobin Davis, does. Okay. Yes, we collaborate. Um, but most important for so many people, um, we write advisory legal opinions. And I'm not going to mislead. If you read an opinion, you don't like it, you can say, you can throw it away and say Freeman doesn't know what he's talking about. The hope, of course, is that the opinions are educational, persuasive, that they encourage compliance with law and knowledge of the law. And where the courts have reviewed the opinions, they've agreed probably 80 to 90 percent of the time. So the track record is pretty good. And um, 
This will sound ridiculous. We've written over the course of years in the neighborhood of 25,000 opinions. And they're all posted online? Not all, <laughs> no, no. Um, we started writing before the era of computers. Yes, um, <laughs> writing. <laughs> so we have indices to opinions, one index involving FOIL, the other involving the Open Meetings Law. And for people who go online, if you scroll to Freedom of Information Law, there will be a drop-down box that will say Advisory Opinions. Mm -hmm. You click onto that and you'll see the alphabet. It's an intuitive alphabetical index. Uh, so if you have a question about uh, whatever it may be, you think about what the... What would be a, a, like maybe a, like a normal or interesting question people would ask you? I mean, what would be your, you know, a regular phone call? A regular phone call? I mean, like a There is a typical. zillion of them. There is a zillion of them. You know, I got, I got a call today from a town clerk who was asking about access to the tentative budget. Um, you know, is it public? Our controller, she said, told us that it shouldn't be disclosed until next week. Um, but the reality is that it's a record covered by FOIL as soon as it exists. That would be a typical call from a, a government official, a town official, local government. We get more calls from local government officials than any other identifiable group. Do they ask you to put it in writing to them, like send them an email? Sometimes. Sometimes. But at this point, we have thousands of opinions available online in full text. Mm -hmm. And often, uh, if I'm on the phone, uh, somebody will raise a question and, and I'll ask, what, what's your email address? They'll give me the email address, I'll pull up an opinion, and before the conversation is over, they will have it. I can email it to them. <laughs> so we, in all honesty, there is, there is more than we can handle. FOIL, in particular, has become something of an industry. And again, there are only two of us. We do a lot of training also. I do 70, 80 presentations a year around the state. Uh, often for local government officials, it might be the League of Women Voters. I did a program for uh, a journalism class at the College of St. Rose last week. Um, we speak pretty mm -hmm. much for anybody who's willing to listen. So it's pretty busy. All right, so um, open meetings law. What is a meeting? That is the age-old question. You know, the open meetings law went into effect in 1977. And at the time, that was a critical question. What is a meeting? And all over the state, various boards, commissions, councils were saying, well, we're just going to get together and talk. We're not going to vote. We won't take action. This isn't a meeting. It's a, it's a workshop. It's a work session. It's a study. It's everything but a meeting. Well, we offered an opinion. And fortunately, the state's highest court unanimously agreed. And since 1978, it has been clear that any gathering of a quorum of a government body for the purpose of conducting public business is a meeting covered by the open meetings law, even if there is no intent to take action, regardless of what well, it's called. And the key word there, I think, is quorum. That's because, a key word. Because if you don't have a quorum, you right. can't vote and make anything official anyway. That's right. With no quorum, there's so, no capacity to take action. So it's not a meeting. If there's less than a majority of the total membership... Or whatever constitutes correct. a quorum. Well, it's always a majority of the total membership. And that's based upon a provision of law that's been on the books in New York since 1909. Now, does that include only government yep. meetings? Yep. Okay, so... The, the laws that we're talking about pertain only to government. governmental entities, correct. Okay, so my Knights of Pythia is saying they that... They can do whatever they want. We can do whatever they based want. Based upon their own bylaws. Okay, so mm -hmm. nothing to do... With Okay, I just want to make sure, you know. Uh, a quorum yeah. in, in your synagogue is 10 men. So you need 10 men. <laughs> Over 13. Also known as a minion, I suppose. That's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, so well, let me, if yeah. it's that important, like we made an interesting statement, it's only in New York State. I mean, what... Mm, New York, well, let me, let me give you some perspective, if I may. Um, I'm sure that you have heard of the Federal Freedom of Information Act. Correct. That is more or less the grandfather of access laws in the United States. It was passed in 66, went into effect in 67. It was terribly weak. Mm -hmm. um, it was significantly altered in 1974. And interestingly, President Ford vetoed the amendments to the Federal Freedom of Information Act. Now, we all 74. know 74. We all know that Congress can override a veto, and I always ask, does anybody know the last time a, a veto was overridden by Congress? It hardly ever happens. 
But Ford's veto was overridden by Congress, which provided a pretty clear message that the public and Congress wanted a reasonable right to know what the federal government was up to. That opened the floodgates. And within 10 years, every state in this country had passed some sort of an open records law, some sort of an open meetings law, and the trend has become international. Um, there are now, depending upon who's, who's doing the counting, approximately 100 nations that have passed some sort of an access to information law. I think President Ford had more veto overrides than any other president. Well, he was dealing with the Democratic Congress <laughs> on the heels of Watergate. Yes. Watergate was the key. You need right. a scandal to enact reforms. And that's exactly what happened. And he was one of them in the legis you know, in Congress before he became right. vice president and president. Right. So he knew who they, he knew who his audience was, I guess, in that sense. And they knew him too. That's right. <laughs> As did Chevy Chase, if you remember. <laughs> yes, from SNL tripping over. Okay, let me ask you. Let, let me ask you. You two uh, fight it out. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> He's the reporter. I'm the rabbi. <laughs> right, that's here. right. So in this case, the reporter knows more. There was something recent about uh, the attorney general. Hmm. Uh, you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about, and this foil and the foil uh, thing. So what? Explain this because I'm stumbling already. So just explain what he tried to do and and what he said and what your opinion was and. Because you yeah, said it was seems, a stretch. This seems to be coming up, and um, I, I had no idea that it received the kind of attention that it has. I was speaking with, a, with somebody in Rochester today, and she, she said, oh, you know, I've been reading about this issue involving the Attorney General. But um, to put this in perspective, FOIL basically says that all government records are available except those records or portions of records that fall within a series of exceptions. One of the exceptions deals with so-called interagency and intra-agency materials, internal communications between or among or within government agencies. And according to the Court of Appeals, the intent of that exception is to enable people in government to express their opinions, their recommendations, their advice without an obligation to disclose. Mm -hmm. The notion is to preserve a deliberative process. Well. Um, that principle has been extended to consultants, consultants retained by agencies. And there are two Court of Appeals decisions that indicate that um, there was a recognition that in some cases government doesn't have the expertise, the wherewithal, the staff to do what it needs to do, and it hires consultants to help them out. Um, in that situation, the consultant acts more or less as an extension of the government agency, Consequently, the communications involving the consultant are treated as if they were prepared by agency staff, they would be intra-agency materials, mm -hmm. and again, the advice, the opinions, the suggestions could be withheld. Um, the issue involving the Attorney General involved communications with his former wife, who is a lobbyist, and she represents a lot of people, um, uh, a lot of firms. And um, his contention was that he informally sought and received recommendations from his former wife and characterized those communications as if they were prepared by a consultant. Um, my opinion focused on a key word in two decisions by the state's highest court, retained. When you retain a consultant, what does that usually mean? You pay them. You pay them. Um, there was no pay, there was no contract, there was no official relationship in that context. Uh -huh. And my opinion was that those communications could not be characterized as having been made with a consultant, therefore the exception did not apply. Um, if it did, if it did, um, I could write to you or you, Rabbi, and say, you know, I know that you're an expert on... Uh, uh, who knows what, uh, Gamora, trade, Gamora. Uh, trade secrets okay. or something like that. Could you, <laughs> could you, could you give me opinion on, on, you know, whether, you know, this, this is applicable in this situation? Would that make you a consultant? I don't think so. I don't think so. And that was the point of the opinion, uh, that, that I offered. And I think I'm right. And I what think did I'm right. the attorney general say? He didn't say anything and still hasn't as far as I know. Well, but... He was under the impression that well, he denied, his communication... He denied a request. He denied a request. 
Um, and um, so you're not, saying not, that it's foilable. I'm saying that it should be available under foil, correct? Because there was no retention. Because there was no via, exception that could have been app, that could have been applied. Because there was n he didn't pay his ex-wife's firm. He didn't pay his ex-wife to offer offer opinions or guidance, right? Oh, I see. That's what I wasn't sure. Yeah. Retain, so why would again, he? Was so why word. would he even ask someone that he wasn't retaining? Because she was his ex-wife and that she has a lot of... I think of because she's probably very smart. She's probably very well connected. My understanding is that she's a political animal. <clears throat> uh, and he asked for her advice. In writing. That was the problem. Email. Right? Email. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Email um, clearly constitutes a record under FOIL. And you probably know this, but one of the distinguishing features between our law in New York and other access laws around the country and around the world is that our law since 1978 has defined what a government record is. Mm -hmm. And um, we included that when we were drafting a revised FOIL in 78 based upon what we perceive to be a deficiency in the Federal Act. To this day, the Federal Freedom of Information Act doesn't tell us what a federal agency record is. Mm. And to this day, there are issues that, that percolate through the federal courts, which involve who prepared it, where did it come from, what is its function. All of those issues were resolved here by 78. And in truth, we just got lucky. If you think about 1978, High tech was an electric typewriter. That's right. We used carbon paper. There was no That's internet. Right. There was no email. That's right. We but had the uh, exactly Xerox, the, the mimeograph, the mimeograph machine. machine. Yeah. Right. Um, FOIL has defined the term record expansively to mean any information in any physical form whatsoever kept, held, filed, produced, or reproduced by, with, or for an agency. So if you send me an email, irrespective of the subject, it's a Department of State record that falls within the coverage of FOIL. Okay, so let me ask you this. In, when I was working in the State Senate, we used our personal email addresses. We were advised to use personal email addresses and stay away from the, NY, the Senate email address. And we were told that it's because the opposition, well, I was working with the Senate Dems, the Republicans were monitoring the, all the emails that went out of all the Democratic offices, everyone was paranoid. Well, mon and so, monitoring is one thing, but, but we're not talking about that, really. If I go home... So what I'm saying is that if, if we were using our own personal emails... Doesn't matter. And we communicated with someone else at work with their personal email... Doesn't matter. What doesn't matter? The fact that you use your personal email. A record is any information kept, held, filed, produced by, but with, it, or for right. a government agency. If I go home and I sit down at my home PC, use my personal email address, and communicate with you, and I do so in my capacity as an employee of uh -huh. the Committee on Open Government. Even though the signature line doesn't say that. Even though the signature okay. line doesn't say that. It is a record. It is a record. Think about this. Um, the issue, I know that, that, that the issue sort of became popular uh, in one of the Spitzer scandals. Um, but it arose prior to that. Um, you live in the town of Bethlehem. Correct. Do school board members have offices in one of the school board buildings? No. Um, town board members have offices in town hall? No. Mm. So what do they do? You know, back in the olden days, if they wanted to communicate with their constituents or each other, they'd have a cup of coffee or they mm -hmm. would uh, uh, get on the phone. Now they communicate via email. They communicate via email. And the question arose early on. A town board member sitting at home communicates with constituents or other town board members. Are those communications subject to FOIL? The answer is clearly yes, because they are government agency records. The fact mm. that they may emanate from outside the walls of government just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Because there are people who insist that they would fight that. And it's just interesting because you're the last word on, final word on this. I mean, uh, some of No, a, a court is the last yeah, word. Yeah, but I was going to say that this, even your opinions have been upheld by the state's highest court. So, you know, I mean, I think people have already seen that your opinions have been validated by I'd the like, courts. I'd like to think that there is a degree of influence, let's put it that yes. way. Yes. People attribute, you know, power, I suppose, to our, we have no power. We have influence. And you, you know, you have a brand. 
that you've created over these years. I guess you could call it that. You know, you yeah. have cachet. Cachet, yeah. <laughs> so one of my kids is involved in branding now, but um, you know, <laughs> he learned that as a, you know when he when he went for his MBA. When can a meeting be closed? That's another FAQ. You your... look at the open meetings law. Structurally, it's similar to FOIL. Meetings are supposed to be conducted open to the public unless there is a basis for entry into what is called an executive session. An executive session is defined by the law to mean a portion of an open meeting during which the public may be excluded. A procedure has to be accomplished in public before an executive session can be held. It's a simple procedure. Somebody on the board or council has to introduce a motion. The motion has to indicate what they want to discuss and the motion has to be carried by a majority vote of the total membership. From there, we look at the eight grounds for entry into executive session. And the question is, hmm, does the subject matter fit within any of those eight grounds? So the open meetings law limits the ability of a government body to exclude the public from its meetings. So what I hear when they close the meetings and they go into executive session is for personnel reasons. Stop. I have said to people a thousand times, eliminate that word from your vocabulary. You have the law in front of you. You look at the eight grounds for entry into executive session. The word personnel is not there. You can read FOIL from beginning to end. It's not there either. And yet, um, I, well, I talk about the, what I, I've come to call it, the personnel myth. How many times have you maybe even written or heard or seen Something in print to the effect that um, somebody says, well, it's a personnel matter, it's confidential. Can't talk about it, the record's not public. There's no law that says that. There's no law that says that. But in the United States, sadly, in too many cases, we've become stupid and sheep-like. And we hear these statements over and over and over again, we begin to believe that they're true. And that's when we begin to lose our rights. Now, clearly there are some discussions involving personnel that may be discussed in private, but there are many others that cannot. Disciplinary actions? Well, that's, that's, one. that's one of them. Um, but let's, let's talk about this just a little bit. Let's say the school board is talking about the budget. Says to itself, hmm, do we really need, can we really afford this art teacher position in the elementary school? Well, gee, what if there's only one elementary school and, and one art teacher? Everybody's gonna know whose position it is. No basis for closing the doors. Why? The issue involves policy. How do we, as the governing body, choose to allocate public monies? Is art really important to the education of our kids? Policy questions. On the other hand, if the question is, does this teacher deserve tenure? Is he or she doing a good job or a not so good job? In that situation, the focus is on, in the words of the law, a particular person and there would be a basis for going into an executive session. Um, the language of the exception, I'll quote it, says that a board may enter into an executive session, not must, but may, because a motion has to be carried by a majority vote, may enter into an executive session to discuss, quote, the medical, financial, credit, or employment history of a particular person or corporation, or matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal or removal of a particular person or corporation. Only then would a board have the ability to close the doors under that exception. Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen the publication of a public employee's salary? Yes. Sure. Well, that's part of a personnel record. Yeah, it's on nysearch.org. It's public. Yeah. There, are lots, there are lots of things about me as a public employee that you can know that I can't know about either of you. Mm -hmm. um, why? Because as a public employee, the courts have found that, that we're, uh, we have a greater duty to be accountable than anybody else. So how much do you earn in your position? Um, you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. It's a little over $40,000. For such a high level position. Should I tell you why? Yeah, tell yeah. me why. <laughs> There's a story here. In tier two of the retirement system, if I had kicked the bucket suddenly, my wife would have gotten no pension. I had to retire to protect her. So I did. So I did. A retired as what? I am a retired state employee. Oh. But fortunately for me, I feel good. I still like my job. Yeah. I'd like to think I'm doing something constructive. And a deal was worked out. And I was rehired as a new employee. And my new salary is the difference between what it had been and my pension. So I'm bringing on the same amount of money. 
the taxpayers are saving a chunk because the basis of my income, the lion's share of the income is from the retirement system, not the state budget. And how much is the retirement? It's about $80,000. 80000 a year plus the forty, so you're getting... I'm um, doing okay. You're doing good. Not well, only that, I'm, collect, I'm collecting Social Security now, too, simply because I'm... What's the word? Old. Yeah. Yes. How yes. old are you? How old? How young are you? 67. I mean, wow, I never thought... Never would have thought that. I think you need new glasses, but thanks anyway. No, really. I mean, I just... Good. <laughs> because well, of all the years you. that I've known... I have I mean, five grandchildren. Look at the... Fa I mean, you know, you, you look at face, you look at the skin, you look at sagging, you know, and all that. You I'm don't a, have I'm any a, of that. I'm a lucky guy. You are. You've got good genes. That's it. Let me ask you, you know, like you taught an example mm -hmm. on a local level, but you hear always the bigger government, like I'm saying, the governor, oh, there's got to be more transparency in, Very good. I was in gov that. government. So, I mean, on a bigger level, what are they, I mean, what would you see, well, that could be rectified? I mean, they really do have a big issue there. There should be transparency in that, that, that. Certainly, I, certainly I agree. And, you know, one of the realities is that here in the city of Albany, the place is filled with political junkies. And, you know, there are issues that we read about on the front page here that nobody cares about That's 25 right. miles away. Um, and the reality is that these laws are vastly more important at the local government level. Um, you know, where does government touch people? You know, if, 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 if uh, you know, if the, uh, and the, there was a problem in Bethlehem with the water, you got a notice from, from the town. Um, if your real property taxes get jacked up, you don't call your U.S. senator or your assemblyman or state senator. You go local. But I will suggest to you that, yes, I think that there are good reasons for, let's say, strengthening the enforcement of the freedom of information law at every level, but especially, especially in relation to those large units of government. State government? New York City. New York City government. They are, they are um, huge. Foil well, has become something of an industry. New, they, York, New York State's the ninth largest budget in the world. Yes, this is this We're the is the ninth largest economy in the world in New York State. It's amazing, and uh, and you know we just have a couple of minutes. But do you think this administration, the Cuomo administration, is transparent? You know, there are some some steps that have been taken that are exceedingly positive. You know, reporters whimper and moan, and I can say it here, fetch on occasion. Um, is it harder now to get information than it was 25 years ago? And my answer is always the same. Have you been to a government agency website lately? Often, you have the ability to acquire instantly information that would have been difficult, if not impossible, to acquire not so long ago. Um, and that is certainly true. Uh, what we can find, what, what has been posted online is much, much, much more extensive than it had been. Um, it's, it's, the, it's the political issues that you read about. Okay. And for obvious reasons, that's where the resistance lies. So when you talk about transparency, okay, a lot has been done in the past 10 years okay. with the you know, sophistication of the Internet and the maturity of the Internet. Sure. But what about the administration itself? I mean, we hear that the governor doesn't want to tell us until he's ready to tell us. You know, as a reporter, you know, as a, as the media, as the you fourth know, estate, uh, uh, you know, the governor says, "Well, we don't know about that," and then he, we find out he knew about it, but he didn't want to tell us because he wasn't ready to tell us. Well, you know, I, I've said this before. I think that there has been some resistance in every administration, and I'm on my seventh governor. Um, there's always been some resistance, and I think it's the job of the news media more than any other identifiable group. To, to be persistent, to be aggressive, to use the law, maybe even by going to court, to ensure that the law is followed the way it's supposed to I be. I think one of the things would be, let's say, the leaders' meeting during budget negotiations. You know, they had it open, and, they, and it was a circus. And then when they closed it and they went behind doors, and then they came out and they said, okay, here's the deal, then... Yeah, know, but the reality was, is that, that it was open for a time not because it had to be. Uh, but because they chose to open it for a time. Yes. Again, the Assembly has 150 members. The Senate has, what, 62, 63? Right. A quorum in the Assembly is 76. Right. You're talking about the three or four or five, five people in the room. There's no quorum of any particular public body. 
the open meetings law simply doesn't apply. Right. I mean, a more critical issue, in my opinion, involves the reality that the rank and file membership of the Senate and the Assembly have, have opted to enable the leadership to have virtually all of the power. Um, I don't think that that's particularly democratic with a small d, uh, but it's the way it has evolved over the course of years, and New York certainly is not different okay. from any number of states. Okay, thanks. We're, I think we're out of time. We're out of time, or yeah. I'm just getting into my uh, social studies uh, lesson. But we, listen, Bob, thanks for coming in. My you're pleasure. doing a great job. I, I think you're really the I try idea hard. of the American over here of what we really want is freedom and open government and should continue with good health and what you're doing. Thank you, and you yes. too. Happy New Year. All, right, all, all around. All yes. Around.